This video is going to be a review of the USVA history curriculum for the state of Virginia, and it is going to cover standard number five. The standard reads, the student will demonstrate knowledge of the issues involved in the creation and ratification of the Constitution of the United States and how the principles of limited government, consent of the governed, and the social contract are embodied in it by A. Explaining the origins of the Constitution, including the Articles Confederation B. Identifying the major compromises necessary to produce the Constitution and the roles of James Madison and George Washington C. Examining the significance of the Virginia Declaration of Rights and the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom in the framing of the Bill of Rights. D. Assessing the arguments of Federalists and Anti-Federalists during the ratification debates and their relevance to political debate today. And E. Appraising how John Marshall's precedent-setting decisions established the Supreme Court as an independent and equal branch of the national government. The essential understandings that Virginia wants you to know are during the Constitutional era, the Americans made two attempts to establish a workable government based on Republican principles, and the Constitution of the United States established a government that shared power between the national government and states' governments, protected the rights of states, and provided a system for orderly change through amendments to the Constitution itself. Additionally, the major principles of the Bill of Rights of the Constitution were based on earlier Virginia statutes. And elements of Federalist and Anti-Federalist thought are reflected in contemporary political debate on issues such as the size and role of government, federalism, and the protection of individual rights. And lastly, the important legal precedents established by the Marshall Court strengthened the role of the United States Supreme Court as an equal branch of the national government. Some essential questions related to the topic include, how did America's pre-revolutionary relationship with Britain influence the structure of the first national government? What weaknesses in the Articles Confederation led to the effort to draft a new constitution? How did the delegates to the Constitutional Convention balance competing interests? What compromises were reached at the Constitutional Convention? And lastly, how was the Bill of Rights influenced by the Virginia Declaration of Rights and the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom? The last three questions that Virginia would like you to consider are, what were the major arguments for and against the Constitution of 1787 in the leading Federalist and Anti-Federalist writings and in the ratification debates? who were the leading Federalists and Anti-Federalists in the pivotal ratification debate in Virginia, and how did Chief Justice John Marshall, a Virginian, contribute to the growth of the United States Supreme Court's importance in relation to the other branches of the national government. The first government that the United States adopted right at the end of the American Revolution were created by the Articles of Confederation. And the Articles of Confederation basically created a framework you know, for the government of these newly established United States of America. And it purposefully created a government without kind of a strong central authority. Uh, and the reason they did this was actually because the leaders were fearful of that type of central authority as the result of their experiences that they had from uh, England and the king uh, prior to the revolution. Some of the important things to understand about the Articles Confederation are that it provided a weak national government and, and basically it delegated most of the powers to the states because of that fear we had just talked about. Additionally, Congress had no power to tax or regulate commerce amongst the states, which also led to other problems. It provided no common currency between the states, so with every state having its own currency, this also caused problems when people were trying to purchase things in other states. And it gave each state one vote in its Congress, regardless of the size. So this really annoyed states like Virginia, who were quite a bit larger than some of the smaller states, in particular like New Jersey. Uh, lastly, it provided no executive, so no chief leader for the group, and also there was no judicial branch from a national perspective. There were state judicial branches, but not federal judicial branches. Keeping those weaknesses in mind, you actually ended up having an event that really would trigger the move from the Articles of Confederation to the United States Constitution. So what happens is that in 1786, uh, there is an event called Shays' Rebellion. And to kind of backtrack a little bit, there was a period of depression after the American Revolution. And this depression had really hit the farmers who had acquired debt to really kind of help meet the demand for war. 
So when this war ended, all of a sudden the prices for the goods that these farmers created dropped drastically, right? There was less demand. And on top of that, the states started to collect more taxes to begin to pay their own debts. So this led to the farmers being unable to pay the taxes and also continuing just to be in more debt. So what would happen is that the state would actually go and begin to seize the farms of some of these people for being unable to pay those taxes that they owed. So this man named Daniel Shays, he gathered about a over 1,000 farmers and, att and basically attacked these courthouses, um, aiming to prevent the, the seizures of more and more farms. Um, the, this event kind of culminated in, in a battle out in Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, but the big thing is that it ultimately exposed the weaknesses of the Articles Confederation because the states, uh, in particular Massachusetts, had no easy way of suppressing this rebellion under the way the Articles Confederation were laid out. Shays' Rebellion was seen as a very large problem for the states, and in particular Massachusetts. Uh, but what happened is, is you're going to now have a number of the wealthy elite uh, people in this country kind of realizing that things like this cannot happen again. Um, and if they do, the more and more they occur, it's going to kind of get in the way of business as usual for these people. And what's going to happen is that they are going to call a convention down in Philadelphia to really kind of originally the thought was to amend the Articles of Confederation to allow some sort of central authority uh, to be able to deal with events like Shays' Rebellion. But what's going to happen is it's going to become apparent that you're going to get this constitutional convention uh, where they're going to kind of actually begin to move away from the Articles of Confederation and actually begin to draft a whole new document. So this constitutional convention is held in Philadelphia in 1787, and George Washington is going to be one of these major figures at this convention. Uh, his presence alone um, is going to give this convention quite a bit of credibility, uh, because remember, he's even back you know, then is this kind of larger-than-life figure. He had seen them through the American Revolution, and he's going to preside over this convention, though he is going to kind of seldom participate in the debates himself. Uh, he's going to be the president of the convention. So additionally, another Virginian that's going to be kind of you know, in the spotlight here is James Madison. And James Madison is this political philosopher who's going to kind of help lead many of the debates on the convention floor, but he's also going to be known for keeping copious notes in relation to what they're actually talking about. And without Madison's notes, you know, we wouldn't necessarily know for sure what was going on in this convention. Uh, and as a result of that, he is going to become known as the father of the Constitution, and that's going to be really important. Amongst the debating at the Constitutional Convention, you're actually going to have two plans emerge from all of it. Uh, and the plans are going to kind of benefit different types of states. And the first one is going to come out of New Jersey and hence become known as the New Jersey plan. And their idea is that each state is going to be provided equal representation per state. So a state like New Jersey, who's much smaller than, say, a state like New York or Virginia, which are the much larger states in the union, um, they're going to get equal representation, all of them, no matter what. So this is going to become also known as the small states plan. So the other plan that kind of comes out is going to be authored by James Madison, and it's going to be known as the Virginia plan. And the Virginia plan is actually going to propose the three branches of government which are going to become adopted, so the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. And they are going to kind of propose that representation is going to be based on state population for the legislative branch. And this is going to be really important because states like New Jersey, who are much smaller, again, are going to be against this because Virginia has quite a bit more people and, and the small states are going to feel that they're going to be able to be strong armed by the large states in Congress uh, when making laws and things like that. And the large states only feel that it's fair because they are home to many, many more people in the Union.
So what you're going to get is kind of actually a combination of the two plans. It's going to become known as the Connecticut Compromise, or really the Great Compromise. And it's going to, as I said, combine these plans to balance the power between large states and small states. And it's going to actually create what's known as a bicameral legislature, creating two different houses. The first house is the Senate, which is provided two representatives per state. Uh, the House of Representatives is going to be the other one, and they are going to be provided representation based on population. So that's going to become important because once the representation in one of these houses is decided upon population, what's going to happen now is that the South is actually going to demand that the slaves are going to count as population or they would not actually ratify the document. Uh, you actually needed nine out of the 13 states to ratify the document, and if there was no kind of compromise met, um, the southern states would actually not ratify and this document would never go into effect. So what actually happens is you get the three-fifths compromise. And what this actually does is it counts slaves. Uh, for every five slaves, they will count three towards the population count for representation in the House of Representatives and also for taxation purposes. Let's take a second to talk about the Constitution as the document itself. So the Constitution makes federal law the supreme law of the land and really limits federal government to those powers that are explicitly stated in the Constitution. So if things are not mentioned in the Constitution, really it's going to give the states considerable leeway to govern themselves. And this is really going to be said in the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution, uh, basically saying that if it's not said, the states get to decide how it is handled. Uh, it's also going to create three co-equal branches of government. Those three branches are the executive branch, which actually executes the laws and is the home of the office of the president and the cabinet. Uh, you have the legislative branch, which creates the law, and that is the home of the House of Representatives and the Senate, which we just talked about. And then lastly, you're going to have the judicial branch, which is the home of the court system and the Supreme Court, which is going to be interpreting the law. And they are the ones that have in some cases, final say on whether or not a law is constitutional and can strike down a law altogether if they decide it is not constitutional. The idea is that they are aiming to provide, you know, not too powerful of a central government. They're trying to balance it between the state's powers and the central government powers, and this is actually known as federalism. And what's going to happen is you're going to get all of these different branches of government uh, having what is known as checks and balances between one another, and that certain aspects of their powers are able to be kind of checked by one of the other branches um, so that no one of branch is too powerful ever. The best example of these checks and balances can probably be seen by tracing a law from its creation until it perhaps it's passing. So when the legislative branch creates a law, uh, it ultimately goes to the president to sign. Should the president decide to sign it, then the law simply becomes a law just like that. And if it gets questioned, it can ultimately be interpreted by the judicial branch whether or not it is an acceptable law or not. However, if the executive branch, the president, decides that he does not like the law, he can do what is called veto the law. And this is one of those checks on the legislative branch's power. So when he vetoes a law, what happens is that law will now go back to the legislative branch. And if they are able to now get two-thirds of a majority in both houses of Congress, then what happens is that law will be actually created even without the signing by the president. And then lastly, again, the judicial branch would have the last say, like we just mentioned. So now that the Founding Fathers had basically come together and decided on what the Constitution should say, um, what's going to happen now is you're going to kind of have two different groups emerge from this convention. Uh, the first group is known as the Federalists, and the Federalists are going to be advocating for the ratification of the Constitution, and the second group is known as the Anti-Federalists, and they are actually going to be arguing that the way the Constitution is written is not actually good enough for them and that they need some sort of guarantee of individual rights. Uh, so ultimately the Federalists really are believing and advocating for the importance of that strong central government.
right? Uh, the by promoting this strong central government, it's really promoting economic development and other public improvements. And this line of thinking has evolved today into kind of the idea that the primary role for the federal government is actually solving problems uh, for the people today. Um, that's kind of its role. In contrast to the Federalists, the Anti-Federalists are actually going to fear an overly powerful central government, uh, and they're going to feel that the Constitution, the way it was written up to that point, was actually going to be destructive of the rights of the individuals and the prerogatives of the state. And they are going to actually look for explicit language um, to be able to kind of spell out those rights of the individuals and the states. Otherwise, they're going to continue to argue against the ratification for the document. Uh, and this today, you know, is kind of more of a conservative line of thinking. And these conservatives are typically are known for championing liberty and also the individual initiative and free markets. So the two sides had to come to some sort of compromise, and the compromise that you're going to get is the creation of a Bill of Rights. And basically, the Bill of Rights is going to be written by mostly by James Madison, and it's going to be come the first 10 amendments to the Constitution of the United States. And what it's going to do is it's going to kind of combine some of the ideas and thinking from a couple other different documents of the time period, in particular the Virginia Declaration of Rights and the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom. And this Bill of Rights is going to guarantee now those rights of the individual and the states we were just talking about. And this is going to be the kind of the final push that actually leads to the ratification of the Constitution. So let's talk a little bit more about those particular documents that had influenced Madison's Bill of Rights. So the first is the Virginia Declaration of Rights, and this was written by another Virginian, George Mason. And this is going to kind of reiterate the notion of these basic human rights um, not being able to be violated by governments, and it's going to kind of explicitly state those rights of Virginians. Uh, the next one is this Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, and that's going to be written by Thomas Jefferson. And this is going to actually outlaw the practice of government support for only one favored church and kind of guarantee the right of all religious freedom to people in Virginia. So Madison is going to kind of draw upon both of these documents when drafting the actual Bill of Rights. When George Washington is chosen as the first president of the United States, one of the things that he's going to be obligated to do is to fill the Supreme Court. And if, if you remember, the Supreme Court is the top of the judicial branch of the United States. And one of the members is going to become what is known as the Chief Justice, or the head of the Supreme Court. And this man is going to be John Marshall, and he is also from Virginia. Under the Marshall Court, you're going to kind of get a number of court cases which are going to kind of help set precedent for the power that's going to ultimately be exercised by the Supreme Court throughout its tenure. And the first big one is going to be known as Marbury versus Madison, and this one is going to be important because it's going to establish the idea of judicial review. And judicial review is basically the, the idea that the court is able to rule laws unconstitutional. And if something is deemed unconstitutional, it will basically make the law uh, basically just disappear and as if it didn't really ever happen. Um, the next one is going to be McCulloch versus Maryland. And this one's going to be important because it's going to establish this idea of implied powers. And what is going to basically be argued is that in the Constitution where it is basically said that Congress is able to make laws necessary and proper to what they need to do, uh, Marshall is going to argue that this basically means that the government is able to use any method that's convenient for carrying out its purposes and powers, um, as long as it's not expressly forbidden elsewhere. Um, and the opponents are going to obviously kind of disagree with this, but once this is established um, through judicial review, which we were just talking about, it's going to kind of set the Precedent, this is the way things are going to be interpreted in the future. And lastly, you have Gibbons versus Ogden, uh, which is going to come a couple years later, and it's basically going to ensure that federal law is going to kind of be seen as greater than state law, especially in this idea of interstate commerce and transportation. So that's it for 
standard 5, and our next video is going to dive into standard 6, which kind of talks about the trials and tribulations of the early presidencies of the United States.